In the 16th century, Istanbul was the capital of the greatest Islamic empire the world has ever known. Ruled by Suleiman the Magnificent, it stretched from Baghdad to Budapest. The center of power was Topkapi Palace, and in the heart of Topkapi was the harem. Into it came hundreds of women from all over the empire and beyond, the personal slaves of the Sultan. But in the imperial palace, sex could equal power. This is the story of those women and of the closed and secret world of the Ottoman harem. In 1520, a newcomer entered the Imperial Palace in Istanbul. Her name was Alexandra Lizovska. She was the daughter of a priest from the Ukraine, captured by slave hunters to join the army of servants and concubines in the service of the Sultan. They were slaves not of Turkish extraction. Either Slavs captured by the Tatars, probably, or from the Caucasus, who were very prized for their looks. White skin, dark hair, and delicate bone structure. And they were predominantly Christian. The enslavement of freeborn Muslims was forbidden by the Quran. In our history, writing about the harem and the sultan's women, or talking about them, is a sin and is forbidden. So nobody has written anything, and we always have to decorate these stories in our imagination. And foreign travelers have also done this. People went to the Ottoman Empire in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries and they were very taken with the idea that there were all these uh, women locked up together. They soon came up with stories that filled in the gaps of their ignorance about what was going on in the harem. Most of those involved a lot of sex, a lot of rather abusive treatment of young women. The first Englishman to catch a glimpse into the imperial harem was a London mechanic sent by Queen Elizabeth I to the palace of the great Sultan to install her gift of an organ. Through the grate I did see 30 of the Grand Signor's concubines that were playing with a ball. At first sight I thought they had been young men, but when I saw the hair of their heads hanging down on their backs, I did know them to be women, and very pretty ones indeed. Bing. breeches so thin I could discern the skin of their thighs through it. I stood so long looking upon them that he who had showed me began to be very angry and stamped with his staff to make me give over looking. The inner part of the palace, especially the harem, was officially called the abode of felicity because the Sultan had a special relationship with God. This was the reason why all the means of happiness were actually supplied. The best food, the best things to drink, the best music, the best singing, the best manuscripts with figures in them, which is frowned upon by strict Muslims. So you have the means to be happy, but it's very difficult to tell whether they actually were happy. A descendant of Suleiman's one of the last princes to have lived in the harem, considered that his ancestors would have found it more lonely than lavish. The prince lived a luxurious life, 
but a very lonely life in a way because all he had were hundreds of women around him. I lived amongst them and I was more or less brought up by them. I didn't realize it at the time that it was anything extraordinary because I was used to it. You think everybody else lives that way. But to the priest's daughter, soon to be known as Hurem, it would have been anything but ordinary. When the girls first arrived, they would be examined to make sure that they didn't have any physical defects, have any diseases. Women come to the harem at an early age. And as soon as they arrive, their clothes are changed and they're taken directly to the hammam, the bathhouse. They are cleaned according to our traditions and taught how to wash before prayers. The type that Turkish men like is what we call balaketli, flesh firm like a fish. And another detail. They say, Iva Gabayi, meaning the belly should be shaped like a quince. In our literature, too, when we describe women, we say cheeks like peaches, lips like cherries, similes like these, and that's what men expect. The Islamic religious law permits polygamy. A man could marry up to four women at any given time and could also have concubines on the side. But as the numbers of polygamous marriages were really very few. Only the ruling class, for example, like your sultans, would have a harem. When he was a young ruler, it was said by foreign diplomats that Suleiman, very lustful, frequently visited the palace of the women and there, in their phrase, did justice, i.e. made love. And indeed, the sultan was encouraged to behave a bit as a prize stud to cover more and more mares so that the biological future of the dynasty was secured. I think the reason that the Ottomans chose to reproduce through concubines is it gave them more reproductive freedom. Um, the difference between having a child with a concubine and having a child with, say, a royal princess is that the princess, the married woman, has many more rights um, as a mother. Concubines, because they are slaves, have fewer rights over children. The sultan was considered to be above society, separate from it. That was the very ideology of the state. You can imagine that a relationship by marriage to a free Muslim woman, the daughter of some important writer in Istanbul or some, would immediately make the sultan related to a segment of society, and this may cause divisions with other segments, etc. These are the personal slaves of the sultans. They don't have any family. They don't have any connections. We don't know the feelings of the women who entered the harem. There must have been fear and terror as well as other emotions, but also the delight of material comforts. And there was a possibility of becoming the Sultan's consort. The imperial harem in 16th century Istanbul was one of the most secret societies in the world. 
Even in the early 20th century, shortly before it was abolished, it was difficult to discover precisely what went on here. I asked my mother and my mother's sisters about their grandmother's life in the harem, and they said that uh, because it was prohibited to talk about the life in the harem, she could tell nothing to them. Modern historians have been less restricted and their discoveries have challenged the old Western fantasies. It's not where women lounged around and spent their time, the sort of Orientalist image we have. We should think of the harem as a unique place, as a collection of females who were more highly educated, more highly trained, and trained in a variety of ways than women in this general society. So I think we might think of the imperial harem as the only female university in the empire. The latest undergraduate was the priest's daughter, Alexandra Lizovska, now known as Hurem, the laughing one. When a woman like Hurem arrived in the harem, she would be given further education. Uh, and by education, I mean some religious training, a knowledge of Islam. She would be taught the etiquette of the court. She would be trained in the skill that most harem women were adept at, that is, embroidery. Wonderful things. The embroidery that she produced could be sold through agents on the market. So it, it was a profitable skill. It wasn't just a, a gentlewomanly skill. They learned the palace attitude. That was not very easy. How to greet people and to walk backwards to leave the Sultan's room. And how to be respectful and well behaved at all times and never be angry. They had lessons every day and most learned to read and write and to read the Quran. Had the prying eyes of Western travelers pierced the outer walls, they would have perceived a vastly different harem from the sexual paradise or inferno of their imagining. Making love is the one thing most inmates of the harem were not doing, at least if they were following the rules. Relatively few got to spend a night with the Sultan. Living there must have been very claustrophobic. If you've got a relatively small space with several hundred women living in it, access to the outside world is very limited. The views over Istanbul, if you could get them, must have been um, quite, had quite an effect on people. It was a very comfortable place, but it was more like a comfy prison than a comfy bordello. and the prison warders were the eunuchs. Only men who had been castrated were allowed into the harem on a regular basis. And like the women, most would spend their entire lives here. The enclosure of women itself seems very objectionable. Um, but perhaps even more objectionable is the mutilation of young men in order to provide uh, eunuchs to staff and protect the harem. It was forbidden by Islamic law to castrate a Muslim or perform the operation on others. So it was carried out by Coptic Christian priests in Egypt. The method of castration, and there are two types. One is cutting the testes and the other twisting and crushing them. Sometimes uh, there's a method called uh, clean-shaven, and uh, which meant that they removed everything. And it made it almost impossible for them to perform their usual body functions. According to one ambassador, they kept uh, silver quills in their uh, turbans, and they would use those quills in order to urinate. One of the duties of the eunuchs was to ensure that the concubines did not have sex with anyone but the sultan, men, women, or whatever else came to hand. 
cucumbers were not let into the harem because they were used uh, as a penis, it is said. <laughs> but the guards themselves were not beyond suspicion. The process of castration was very frightening and difficult for the boys, and often, out of fear, their uh, testicles would retreat. They would remain intact, and sometimes over time, they would be able to function sexually. There are many accounts of the eunuchs having relationships with the women in the harem. This was one reason why the eunuchs in the harem were exclusively African. It was one way of making sure that these men couldn't inseminate the female members of the imperial family without everybody noting that she'd given birth to a uh, half-black child. But for Huren, as for most newcomers to the harem, there was little opportunity for dalliance with eunuchs or anyone. If the girls were higher in the power structure of the harem, they would be given their own quarters. But the rest of the girls would uh, share their rooms. There were older women who watched over the younger girls to make sure that they weren't getting into any kind of a mischief, such as talking in the dark, sharing their bed together. Girls' boarding school or comfy prison, it was not perhaps the happiest of estates for the daughter of a priest. But if Huren dreamed of improving her lot, there was always the possibility of sex with the Sultan, though this too was hedged with its own barriers of ritual and restraint. There's some report that you know, sultans like to watch lots of pretty girls sort of jumping about in the all together. Um, there's the story that the sultan would throw a handkerchief towards the woman who caught his eye. The surprised virgin snatches at this prize and good fortune with such eagerness that she is ravished with joy before she is deflowered by the sultan. Such reports have never been verified, and for most harem women not yet numbered among the favourites, a handkerchief was just another item of laundry. Very few of them ever got to see the Sultan, let alone jump into his bed. I mean, in order to get anywhere, not just be washing the Sultan's underpants the rest of your life, you had to manoeuvre yourself into a position with the women who chose who went to bed with the Sultan, his mother. In reality, the Sultan's mother would scout for suitable candidates among these now derelict pools and fountains in the bowels of Topkapi. And physical attraction was far from being her only criteria. An eligible concubine would obviously need to be attractive. She needed to be healthy because her principal job was reproduction. Because of the important role that mothers played in training their sons, she also needed to be shrewd. And the way they were introduced was that they were <clears throat> asked to go to a semi-covered pool underneath the Crown Princess apartment. And that was an opportunity for the sultans to watch them and observe them and choose their favorites. Whatever it was that brought Hurem to the attention of the sultan, or indeed his mother, the preparations for her first night with him would have followed a well-established ritual. The day she is going to be with the Sultan, she goes to the bathhouse and has face and body treatments. And her hands and hair are painted with henna. 
The idea of any hair on the body was a thought of horror, and so they would remove any kind of hair, including their pubic hair. What they used was really an awful smelling paste that contained arsenic. And if you left it too long, it could burn the skin very badly. And they used muscle shells to scrape it off. They would put henna, four fingers, above the pubic area as a decorative, beautiful design detail. Concubines were assumed to be virgins. But I don't think we can assume the naivete and the innocence that kind of goes along with the whole notion of virgins. I mean, these women were prepared for their job. I don't know the details. We have stories written by European observers. Are they fanciful? Are they true? It's hard to know. All the older women, and those who have had his good graces before, go to the favourite of the day, congratulating her for the great distinction which she has received, and saluting her as befits the concubine of the Emperor, dressing her superbly, and decking her out with countless jewels. She would be given new clothes and shoes and, and trained also in the erotic arts. We don't really know exactly what that entailed. I think we have to assume, however, that the Sultan's mother, his sisters, experienced women, high-level women within the harem, would probably provide the finishing touches, would explain the particular person that the concubine would encounter. My son is like this. Your lord is like this. The court musician, Albert Bobovy, provided a colorful account of the courtship ritual. While music is played, the women sing before her and conduct her to the door of the chamber where there is a eunuch who tells the sultan of her arrival and has her enter when the sultan commands it. As soon as she sees him, she must go to him running and kneel at his feet, and he receives her and holds what conversation seems good to him with the women's music continuing to play at the door while she is with him. There are also stories of her entering the bed from the foot of the bed. So the sultan would be waiting for this beauty to crawl from the foot of the bed and reach him. Whatever happened that night, Suleiman wanted it to continue. Hurem was invited back to his bed again and again. She was soon firmly established as the Sultan's favorite, to the exclusion, records tell us, of all others. The Venetian sources tell us that he fell in love with her. a deadly rivalry had reached into the harem. It was not simply a question of who would occupy the Sultan's bed. It was a far more vital conflict over who would produce the next ruler of the Ottoman Empire, the new favorite, Hurem, or the old favorite, Mahi Devran. Mahi Devran was the mother of the oldest son. So that Hurem coming in, obviously being the Sultan's new favorite, was a threat to her. According to Venetian reports, Mahid Devran picked a fight with Hurem and called her soiled meat. A piece of meat off the slave market. And this provoked uh, a physical struggle between them. Hurem's face was scratched, her hair was pulled. 
And the next time the Sultan called for Hurem, she replied she was unworthy of his attention since she was soiled meat. And of course this intrigues Suleiman, piques his curiosity and he calls her again. And she tells the whole story, of course, with Mahi Devran appearing as the bad guy. Here's an early sign of Hurem's intelligence and ability to manipulate the whole palace system. Hurem knew how to play her cards. You have to think how the women we know about got to where they got. We know about them because they fought their way tooth and claw up the ladder. It was incredibly intensely sort of concentrated ball of intrigue. Battling, jockeying for position, hoping to produce an heir. Hurem gave birth to her first son, Prince Mehmet, in 1521. If Suleiman had played the game by the rules, he should now have moved on to a new woman. But he didn't. Before Hurem's time, if a concubine of the Sultan produced a son, then she was kicked out of bed. Hurem produced one son, but then she produced several more. Suleiman kept her in his bed. There are a number of reasons why they followed this one mother, one son principle. Mothers were important advisors to their sons. So for us two sons to have to share a mother meant they only had half of an advisor, had half a support. If a woman is identified with only one son, she is completely with him in this game of power. And it was a game Hurem had to win. Under Islamic law, all sons had an equal right of inheritance. But in the Ottoman court, the losers lost more than the throne. The sons of a sultan were in combat. Survival of the fittest the one who was strongest, most able, became the sultan. The sons were going to vie amongst themselves to become the sultan. And it was winner takes all. They had to race to Constantinople, they had to raise the support, and when they were acclaimed sultan, they put all their brothers to death. All dynasties have had problems in securing an uninterrupted and legitimate succession. Many wars have been started in England and France by discontented royal brothers or cousins or other relations. The Ottoman solution was to have a harem, so there was no lack of male heirs. After the Sultan's accession, other male members of the dynasty were murdered. If I had lived in those days, since I was the younger brother, I would probably have been strangled very young or even as a small child. But then after being strangled, I would have been buried with great ceremony, which is not much of a consolation. By 1530, Suleiman had five sons, and four of them were by Hurem. Hurem troubled people. They weren't used to a sultan keeping up a relationship with one woman, and they worried that Suleiman had, had, had gone head over heels in love. The foreign sources tell us that people even went so far as to call her a witch because of their fear that she had somehow seduced the sultan new concubines were brought into the harem in the hope of tempting Suleiman from the path of fidelity. They included two Russian women with the same highly prized looks as Hurem. Women given directly to the Sultan would be highly cultivated, attractive, intelligent women. Naturally, she might see a competition. Anyway, the story goes, she was so put out through a fit that the Sultan had to give them away. 
So here we see another sign of Hurem being able to manipulate the politics of the harem and, and to use her own special position as a real favorite of the Sultan. Other eligible concubines were married off as virgins to Suleiman's courtiers. And then, in 1534, 14 years after Suleiman and Hurem first made love, the Sultan made an even bigger break with tradition. Western observers were astounded. This week there occurred a most extraordinary event. Unprecedented in the history of the Sultans. Suleiman has taken to himself as his empress, a slave woman from Russia. He married her, which is the incredible thing. The sultans didn't marry their concubines. They didn't, they didn't need to. The concubine, by definition, is a man's female slave. According to the religious law, you can't marry your own concubine. So you have to free her in order to marry her. There is great talk about the marriage, and none can say what it means. One thing it meant was power. For the first time in their history, the Ottomans had a queen. After she was married, we start calling her Hurem Sultan. And she was really like a queen. She builds up diplomatic relations, and she also influences her husband politically. In another move that impressed Western observers, Hurem occupied new apartments, next to her husband. The chambers of the Sultana are very splendid, with chapels, baths, gardens, not only for herself, but her maids as well. But for long periods, the two lovers were apart. Suleiman was a fighting sultan who had already extended his empire westward. He took Belgrade. He destroyed the whole of the Hungarian ruling classes in 1526, the Battle of Mohash at a stroke and rode into Buda, a conqueror. And by 1529, he was at the gates of Vienna. But even on campaign, his thoughts were with Hurem. He sent frequent love letters and poems. Where we can get nearer to his personality is through his poems, which are remarkable for any ruler. The green of my garden. My sweet sugar, my treasure, my love who cares for nothing in this world. My master of Egypt, my Joseph, my everything. The queen of my heart's realm, my land of the Roman Caesars, my Baghdad and Khorasan. Lovely, lovely poems exist that pass back and forth in correspondence between the two. If the seas were to become ink and these trees pens, when could they write an account of this parting? There is no limit to the burning anguish of separation. Let my soul gain at least some comfort from a letter. Your son and daughter weep from missing you. But Hurem's letters also reveal her fears for the safety of her sons. The favoured heir to the throne was Prince Mustafa, the son of Hurem's old rival, Mahi Devran. Mustafa had the support of the army and the Grand Vizier, Ibrahim Pasha. Some viziers were captured slaves like Ibrahim Pasha. He did become a companion and a favourite of the Sultan. They would generally dined together and he would his bed was in the same room as the sultans there are even stories of intense emotional relationship 
Some Europeans spoke of a sexual relationship. Maybe yes, maybe no. In any event, that was a very close emotional and political relationship. So as a very young man, probably in his 20s, he was suddenly the top man in the empire after the Sultan himself. <laughs> Suleiman had cemented this relationship by giving his own sister in marriage to Ibrahim. None of this pleased the ambitious Hurem. Ibrahim's prestige was something she could not tolerate. We should not uh, forget that we are talking about uh, power politics here. 16th century Ottoman Empire was at its height. That meant tremendous power. So, of course, she wants to undermine him. In one of her letters, Hurim refers to a disagreement with Ibrahim Pasha. She writes to Suleiman, and now you inquire about why I'm not with Ibrahim Pasha. You'll hear about it when... You will hear about it when I am granted my next meeting with you. For the moment, give the Pasha our greetings. We hope they will be acceptable to him. Ibrahim played into her hands Within very short space of time, he acquired lots of uh, wealth. Solomon the Magnificent could figure out where that wealth was coming from. At least partially, it was graft. If graft and corruption were among Ibrahim's faults, another was an arrogant assumption of his own worth. He is reported by one ambassador as saying, though I am the sultan's slave, slave whatever, whatever I say I is do, done. I can at a stroke make a pasha out of a stable boy. I can give kingdoms and provinces to whosoever I choose and my lord will say nothing against it. Ibrahim's confidence was misplaced. And on the 15th of March, 1536, Ibrahim Pasha accepted, as usual, the Sultan's invitation to dine with him. They eat at the same table until late at night, according to Ramadan traditions. They talk and entertain themselves, and then they go to bed. We don't really know what happened that night. But obviously, the Sultan had decided that the Grand Vizier had become too powerful. As a compliment to his boyhood friend, Suleiman apparently ordered the same method of execution reserved for his own kin, garroting with a bowstring so there would be no spilling of royal blood. But Ibrahim put up too much of a struggle. Suleiman, in both Ottoman sources and in European sources, is frequently portrayed as a man of ire. Anything that threatened the state or that threatened his own integrity as ruler would motivate him to take violent moves. The next morning, Ibrahim's body was found outside the palace. This is a reminder of how Ottoman government worked. You could raise a peasant from the dust to be Grand Vizier, but his life hung by a thread. The next day, Ibrahim's wife, Solomon's sister, comes to the palace and blames the sultan for her husband's death. Solomon goes to the harem to find shelter in Harem's arms. It's hard to see that Solomon himself would have done it without Harem egging him on. She wanted to be absolutely sure of her control, and until Ibrahim was out of the way, there was always a danger that she might be packed off herself. She was ruthless. She had to be ruthless. 
but the danger remained, and death was not under Hurem's exclusive control. In 1543, Hurem's ambitions received a fatal blow. Her young son, Prince Mehmet, was struck down by smallpox. His death began a new race for the succession, and the frontrunner was Mustafa, now in his 30s, the son of Hurem's old rival, Mahi Devran. This would mean death for Hurem's surviving sons. Suleiman's favorite son was Mustafa. He was also a favorite of the army. He was tall, he was strong, he was handsome. Uh, he, could, you know, he was going to be a great ruler, and everyone thought very highly of him. If Mustafa were to ascend the throne, the murder of her own children would be inevitable. It was impossible for Harem to accept this. The story is usually looked at as one of intrigue and competition among the mothers around their sons. I think there's a, a larger political context for this. Mustafa was very, very popular with the soldiers. He was a rival to his father without meaning to be, just by virtue of his popularity. And the Sultan was persuaded that Mustafa was conspiring against him. The story is that Hurem had an ally. It was the husband of her daughter, Mehima. Harem women could establish important alliances with male political actors through the marriages of their daughters. And this daughter's husband was the Grand Vizier. The new Grand Vizier was an important ally for Hurem and ideally placed to whisper slanders in the Sultan's ear. Word began to reach Suleiman while he was out on campaign that Mustafa was plotting against him. And Mustafa himself was very upset when news of these allegations reached him, and he went to see his father. Mustafa reached Suleiman's base in Iran and went straight to his tent. A Western diplomat reported what happened then. As soon as he entered the tent, several sturdy mutes made a determined attack upon him. They hurled Mustafa to the ground and, throwing a bowstring round his neck, strangled him. It was said that Suleiman urged the mutes to greater efforts, but Hurem was widely blamed for her role in the murder. I don't think Suleiman would have listened to these stories if he hadn't himself felt that there was a legitimate threat and that despite the fact that he was going to alienate so many people by executing his son, that this was probably the wiser move for the integrity of the empire. If tradition paints Hurem as the villain of the piece, it was at a time when powerful women were widely perceived as a threat to the established order. Hurem's contemporaries were Queen Elizabeth of England, Catherine de' Medici of France, and Mary Queen of Scots, whom the Calvinist John Knox dubbed the Monstrous Regimen. Hurem aroused similar hostility among the Ottoman elite, though the extent of her power has been disputed. Hurem was obviously a very powerful woman. It's difficult for us to know how powerful, because, of course, you know, as today in the corridors of power, things are decided in corridors and not written down. She was his eyes and ears, and of course, when the Sultan is away, it means she could probably do a few things on her own account as well. Hurem was a very smart and shrewd person, and she would write giving him news of what was going on, both within the family, but also political news. There's one letter she wrote when Suleiman was fighting the Iranians. She said, so everybody here in Istanbul is waiting to hear good news. 
They're ready to set up a parade, and we don't have any good news from you. Do you need a victory? Now, if a messenger arrives saying, no progress here, nothing there, no one is going to be very happy, my sultan. Harem was sensitive to public opinion, and she embarked on an ambitious building plan. One of the major expressions of power was building, building large mosques. That had in the prerogative of males in the dynasty. And Horem is, in some ways, the first woman who builds quite publicly. But the public expression of Horem's power was undermined by a fatal flaw. She had removed the main rival for the throne, but she had two sons, and they couldn't both rule. Under Ottoman law, one would have to die. Before the problem could be resolved, she became seriously ill. Suleiman, old now and also in bad health, kept vigil at her bedside. But even as he watched her fight for life, he must have known he would have to make a terrible choice over which of their sons would succeed him. It was probably Hurem's fortune that she did not live long enough to see the power struggle between her two sons. The younger son took arms against his older brother and the sultan. Suleiman had his youngest son executed as a traitor. But by then he had lost the love of his life. Hurem died on April the 18th, 1558, 38 years after she had first entered the harem. Suleiman takes to a sort of ascetic lifestyle. He dines off earthenware platters, and this is the man who was changing his clothes every day into a sort of cloth of gold. He becomes religious, but morbid. Eight years after Hurem's death, Suleiman joined her in the cemetery of Suleimani Mosque. 400 years later, Hurem's tomb has become a shrine for women who cherish the memory of a great Ottoman queen. Hurem really builds the foundation of this very public power that women have, although she herself was unpopular at this time. Her power was as a concubine, and that troubled people. That she was a concubine, uh, a sexually active woman in power, a problem. Hurem had devoted 38 years of her life to ensuring that one of her own sons succeeded to the throne. But ironically, instead of providing the world with another Suleiman the Magnificent, she had blazed the trail for future generations of harem women whose power would eclipse even her own.